Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I hope you're staying safe and doing well in this difficult time. Today, I want to talk to you about one of our last topics in this field of state space search, which is this business of adversary search, which is the idea that instead of just trying to solve a problem, you're trying to defeat an opponent. And that turns out to be particularly challenging to do, but state space search still has a lot to say about how you do it. This first talk, I'll talk about some of the basics and some of the ideas behind game theory and adversary search. And then the next talk will be about some of the sort of introductory implementation details of how you do this stuff. So, so far, we've been tackling puzzles. We've been tackling real world problems where our adversary is in some sense nature. We're trying to solve a problem, overcome some intellectual obstacle, sure, but the intellectual obstacle isn't, uh, isn't fighting back. And now we want to consider the case where we're playing a game. And this is probably the easiest kind of way to think of this idea of actually having an opponent, having an intelligent system fight back against us. And so we not only have to overcome a passive intellectual obstacle, we have to overcome an active one. So let's consider two player games to start with. So we're gonna make a whole bunch of restrictions on the kind of game we're gonna think about. And these restrictions are mostly about the fact that if you don't make them, it's very difficult to understand how to proceed with analyzing the game. And they seem pretty strict, but when we're done, we'll still have plenty of games left to think about. So we're gonna consider games that are exactly two players, not one, because that would be what we did before, not three or more, because that gets complicated really fast for reasons I won't go into right here. And we're gonna assume that for now, we're going to assume that we have what's called perfect knowledge. And what that means is that there are no hidden elements or secrets in the game. If the player holds cards, I can see all their cards are all face up. If the player has pieces, I can see where the other player has pieces, I can see where they're placed. I can see all my own cards, I can see all my own pieces. So there's no secrets in terms of the game state. The game state is 100% identifiable at any given point by just looking at it. So that's the perfect knowledge condition. Second condition, no luck. We're not going to think about games with dice or shuffling or anything like that that has a random element. We're going to only consider things where everything's deterministic. We're going to consider games where the two players take turns. One side goes, and then the other side goes, and then the first side goes again. So no games that are racing games like spoons or something where you know, there's some real time or Twitch aspect to it. This is just traditional games where you take turns. We're gonna only think about games that always end. And that seems like a weird rule. A good example of a game that doesn't have a well-defined ending condition is Backgammon, which also has luck, but it also has the property that you can't guarantee it will end after any finite number of turns. A game without luck that has that property is Awari on a lot of the, or Mancala, or any of the mostly African origin stone and pebble games where you move stones between, sorry, pebble and pit games where you move stones around between pits. Those do not have a well-defined end condition. They can, in principle, go on arbitrarily long. We want games that are guaranteed to end after a finite number of turns. And finally, we're gonna restrict ourselves to games where when the game does end, first of all, there is a well-defined final score, and we'll talk more in a second about what score means. And second of all, we have the zero-sum property. Now, zero-sum is one of those phrases that's super commonly misunderstood. What it means is this. Let's take a game of chess. Now, how do we score a game of chess? Well. I know you're thinking about piece values and stuff like that, but you shouldn't be. The re really, the answer with chess or checkers or any game of this sort is that typically we score it as I get one point for a win, I get minus one points for a loss, and I get zero points for a draw. 
And if you go look at a chess tournament, that's essentially how the scoring is going to go is one, zero, one, minus one. And the zero sum property is just that if I take my score at the end of the game and add sum my opponent's score with it, I always get zero. So if I get one, my opponent has to get minus one. If I get minus one, my opponent has to get one. And if I get zero, my opponent has to get zero. The zero sum property is important because otherwise there might be strategies in which it's better off for us to cooperate. If the sum can be greater than zero, then I don't have a pure adversary anymore because it might be in both our best interests to play together. Um, so you've got to kind of watch out for that kind of stuff. So this still leaves all the games. Checkers is perfect knowledge, no luck, turn-based, always ends, well-defined final score and zero sum. Is it always ends though? Uh, that's a little more complicated. Chess has all these properties. Chess always ends because we put a whole bunch of special rules in tournament chess to guarantee the game always ends. We, uh, quite aside from the use of a clock, we forbid repeated positions of a certain kind. We have move limits. And so, yeah, it's designed to always end. Connect Four is a game that pretty clearly has all these properties. I don't know if you've seen Connect Four where you drop discs in from the top of some tray. And it's certainly perfect knowledge. I can always see what the state of the game is. There's certainly no luck in Connect Four. I can, I don't have to, there's no coins or to flip or dice to roll or anything like that. It's, we take turns. It's clearly always over when the rack fills up, if not before. And there's a well-defined final score. Again, either, and it's zero sum. Either I win and my opponent loses, or I lose and my opponent wins, or we draw. Tic-tac-toe probably the simplest game that we spend much time analyzing that has all of these properties. They're all there. So it isn't like we've ruled out all the games with this very restrictive definition, but what it means is we can use adversary search as a particular analysis trick for actually building intelligent players for these games. So we use a state space search for our side to try to find good or maybe even find best plays, you know, the best move from a given state, and, you know, we can actually use search to do that. And that's pretty cool. It's pretty powerful. So what do I mean when I say that it's a state space search? What's the state space in my game? Well, there's a bunch of things that make up the state, right? For board games, it's the board position, right? Where are the checkers? Where are the chess pieces on the board? Where are the X's and O's on my tic-tac-toe board? Uh, the side I move is part of the state. Whose turn is it, right? If it's checkers, then it's, you know, red goes first and black goes second. But, you know, the point is that which side is on move matters. A position that might be a checkmate if it's my turn to move, might be a checkmate for the other side if it's their turn to move. That's a kind of position you can construct in chess, so it's part of the state. And sometimes elements of the game history are part of the state, which is super awkward to work with in practice, and we often just ignore it even though it's true. So in checkers, there is no history that's part of the game state, which is part of why checkers isn't technically a terminating game. Uh, in chess, like I say, we make the history part of the, part of the state so that we can force the game to terminate. But that means that now, in principle, the value of a position depends partly on its whole history. That doesn't sound good. In practice, we often just ignore that. And so we have these states made up of these elements that are sort of what's the game like at an instant frozen in time whose turn is it where are things what can you know what can happen next based on what's going on so end up with a directed graph where the neighbors in the state space are the states after we make a legal move and one of the tricks as we start to do adversary search is to quit concentrating on moves you know, one of the first things we figured out back in the 50s about this is that moves aren't very interesting. Moves are sort of a side effect of changing states. And in a chess game, 
I will select a move that puts me in a state I want to be in, not a move that is good for its in its own sake. Moves are just an accident. They're the labels of the edges in the state space graph. But since we're trying to traverse the state space graph, we're mostly interested in the nodes of the states. Notice that in a game like chess or checkers, the state space can be cyclic. We can go back to a state we were in previously. That's certainly a possible thing to do. And so we gotta watch out for that. We're gonna end up having to think about stop lists in a lot of games. Notice in a game like Tic-Tac-Toe or Connect Four, it's strictly acyclic, right? Once I've put an X or an O down, I can never come back to that state again because the board only gets more full with every passing turn. So that's nice. I don't have to worry about stop lists there. So here's the interesting idea. And this is an idea due to John von Neumann, one of the founders of computer science, as well as an amazing mathematician, and John Nash. And is this minimax idea and the idea here is that any state in the game with best play by both sides that is if both sides could absolutely look ahead through the entire state space graph and pick you know their best states on their turns then any two-player game that meets all those other criteria above has a well-defined value of the position. And what that means is that for the side on move, there's some, it's either, that position is either a win, a loss, or a draw in chess. So we don't know how to find that move for reasons we'll talk about, but we know that for any state in the game of chess, if we had an infinitely fast computer running with infinite amounts of memory, we could instantly compute whether that position was a position in which white would win, a position in which black would win with best play by both sides, or it would be a draw. Now, obviously, bad play can convert a winning position into a draw or a, or a draw into a loss, but one of the assumptions we're going to make here is that our opponent, our adversary, is just as smart and just as capable as we are. And that turns out to be a really useful assumption because it turns out to be a very safe assumption. If you assume the worst, which in this case is, well, they're as smart as we are, then you never go wrong in funny ways. Uh, but on the other hand, it can mean that you miss some opportunities. There might be situations in which you're losing with best play by both sides, but you're pretty sure the other side won't have best play. That's called expect max play or exploitive play, and it's a thing we won't talk about here. So what's the next, what's the idea here? The idea here is to take advantage of the zero sum nature of the game, right? Well, so I'm sitting in a state. I'm sitting here looking at a chessboard or a tic-tac-toe board or whatever, and it's my turn to move. How do I decide what move I want? Well, for each move I could make, there's a next state where my opponent's on move, right? And so I can compute the value of that state, assuming I can compute the value of that state, right? Well, it's zero sum. If that state has a score of plus one for my opponent, it means that state has a score of minus one for me and I really don't want to move there, right? And so I can look at all the moves I can make, what states are left, and if I can calculate my opponent's value for those states that they end up in, I could just negate them to get my value for each of those moves, and I'll pick a move with maximal value. And it may be that all the moves have leave me with value minus one, in which case I'm in a losing position and I have to pick one somehow, maybe randomly. If uh, it may be that all the moves have me in a winning position, in which case I just pick one somehow, maybe randomly, and I win, I'm still winning the game. But if there are choices, I want to pick the ones that are better for me. But how do I get that value for my opponent? Well, I turn around, and from the opponent's point of view, they have a bunch of moves that they could choose at that point, right? And each one leads us to a successor state where I'm on move, and they're gonna do the exact same thing I did. They're gonna recursively, you know, they're gonna value it, 
And how do they value those? Well, they flip things around, right? So there's gonna be this recursive thing where we alternate and we're gonna explore all possible sequences of moves in principle. That would be the ideal thing to do. If we can explore all possible sequences of moves, you'll notice that all sequences of moves end because we said the game was terminating, right? Every game of tic-tac-toe gets over. And so by doing this recursive search where we negate at each level of the tree, we can compute the, uh, we can find a next state for us, that is a move that is the best possible state. We can play perfect tic-tac-toe. And so if, you know, if I have some state that's, uh, I wanna find the value of, I look at my, ch at all the children of that state, maybe there's a bunch of children over here that have a value of minus 1.0 when I evaluate them, maybe this one has a value of minus 1.0, maybe over here the value is 0.0, .0. And then, so I flip around to be, how do I know that? Well, I flipped around to my opponent. They found that there was a state with value 0.0, .0 and all the other ones, their successors were 1.0. So when these recursions bottom out and these blue triangles represent giant, you know, exponentially sized piles of computation because they're trees of some kind with a big branching factor and a lot of depth. When that computation bottoms out, I can compute the true value of this position, which says I'm winning, but more importantly, I can compute the, if I take this move, then I am, that, that means my opponent's losing in that position, and so I'm winning, my opponent's losing, and it's their turn, and then they have to figure out what they're gonna do. So, that's Negamax search, in a nutshell. Notice that there's some print pruning that we can already do here, some really simple pruning, what's called win pruning. In this position, once I've found that this move is a win for me, I don't have to pay attention to any of this stuff in this last batch, right? Which is a huge amount of stuff to search through, but there's no point, because I've already found a winning move. I might as well just take a winning move and not look for other moves. And that kind of pruning can be really important from an efficiency point of view. And it's true whether it's immediate win, I just capture my opponent's king in chess, or whether it's by a line of force play I've found. And so what we want to do is look at moves that are going to be good for us early. And what we'll talk about next lecture is a generalization of that that tends to get us really good pruning in a lot of cases. So what does it mean for a game to be solved? So. A uh, friend, a, a, an acquaintance of mine, this is, maybe you could go as far as friend, uh, Jonathan Schaefer at University of Alberta, a couple decades ago now, I guess, solved the game of checkers, which was one of those things that nobody expected to happen because the state space was big. Solving tic-tac-toe, not a huge deal. Solving checkers, huge deal literally a huge deal and what does that mean that he solved checkers it means that we now know that checkers is a draw with best play by both sides and further if every player we, we know how to achieve that draw um and that's more important than just knowing the value, right? There's examples of games. There's a game called Hex you can look up that we know the value of the game is a uh, first player win, but there's no known algorithm for efficiently finding the moves of a first player win. So it's not all that useful. With checkers, we have a giant table that Jonathan Schaefer built at University of Alberta and his colleagues and students, that if both sides are playing perfect checkers will result in the moves being just look upable from the table. That's what's called a weakly solved game. Uh, because we know the value of every state that is reachable from the starting state by best play. Tic-tac-toe is strongly solved in the sense that we can build literally a table that has all the states of tic-tac-toe and tell you an optimal move for each state. In fact, tic-tac-toe's search space is so small that with just a little bit of care, you can do that with a pencil and paper without you know, 
hours, not days. And so the, the game of tic-tac-toe is strongly solved. From any given position, we know how to do it. I have strongly solved in the probabilistic sense. Yahtzee, I've strongly solved Shut the Box. I've strongly solved some other simple games. Um, it's always fun to solve a game, and that's what solved means here. So Hex's value is known, but we, we don't even say it's weakly solved because we don't know how that known value doesn't help us with the play. Checkers is weakly solved, Tic-Tac-Toe is strongly solved, and a guy named Victor Alice back in the 90s, I want to say, late 80s, something like that, solved a whole bunch of, strongly solved a whole bunch of games that were really surprising. Connect Four is known to be a first player win. Awari is known to be a first player win. Uh, oh no, sorry, that's not due to Alice. Connect Four is known to be a first player win. Awari is known to be a first player win due to a group in <sighs> Scandinavia somewhere. Um, so we have a bunch of games where we know what a perfect player looks like. Chess, we're nowhere close to knowing how to solve that game. But we still have players that play sort of empirically, sort of statistically, better than the best humans by so much it's not even close anymore. And up until five or 10 years ago, the strongest chess programs by far were just very, very fancy versions of the adversary search we're studying in here. And Google made a breakthrough in machine learning well, Google-sponsored research made a breakthrough in machine learning five or ten years ago, and now there's also a big machine learning component in the best chess players and Go players and so forth. So the last thing that for some reason didn't make it onto the slides, but I should talk about, then we'll let it go, is... Okay, fine, that's a lot of puzzle solving, that's a lot of gameplay, what's the deal in the real world? Well, in the real world, there's some obvious applications of all this in finance, where we have to think about moves in a game where the state space is the state space of investments or negotiations or something like that. We can model those as games. There's military applications of this. A war game is literally a game with states. There's sort of in any situation where people are pushing back in secure computer security, we can think about moves of an attacker and a defender in some state space. And so these things are out there. But also the other reason that we care so much about this is that very early on in AI, as soon as we built computers practically, Everybody asks, well, what would be really intelligent? How would we know if, if a computer is really reached intelligence? And the answer was, well, if it plays a great game of chess. Everybody understands that the thing that really distinguishes man from the animals in terms of intelligence is that people can play chess. And mankind, I should be careful. People can play chess. And so we embarked on a literally 60-year quest to build superhuman chess players. And along the way, we discovered a whole bunch of surprising things, like the existence of computational complexity and complexity hierarchies, we discovered. We discovered the uh, bag of tricks that lets us build very strong chess players, computer chess players, without understanding much of anything about how humans play strong chess. And at the end of the day, by the time we got to where the chess players were the unquestioned champions of the world, the computer chess players were the unquestioned champions of the world, Nobody agreed anymore that this was great evidence for the intelligence of computers. And that goes back to what we talked about the first day of these talks is one of the best definitions of AI is the stuff that humans can do but computers can't do yet, at least in working practice. 
So that's what I have to tell you about today. Like I say, we'll go on and talk about a few of the details of how this state space search can be efficiently executed for a large game like chess. I hope you're all staying safe and well out there. Please be careful in these difficult times. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to talking to you again real soon.